that's good. Hey, get your Bible, go to the book of Ezra once again. Ezra, if you don't mind, I hope you don't mind. Ezra, chapter number six tonight. Ezra, chapter number six. And uh, uh, we, of course, course, are just finishing up that part one from last week. We did. Now part two. Got a little bit too much of an echo there, voice. And so help me out there. Number Ezra, chapter six. And I'll just read a couple verses if you don't mind and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. There's a lot in this thing so I'm just going to read, actually I'll just read the first verse and we'll get started. Then Darius the king made a decree and search was made in the house of the roll where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. Father bless now, help us, encourage us and I just pray now that as we just take that verse and springboard into the rest of it, dear God that we'd understand what's going on and dear God I don't understand what's going on but that God get understanding for our lives today. Would you help us now, I pray, and give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to remind you again just some things before we get going here. Um, first of all, it's not only outline. We've kind of shared that with you last week also. But just want to let you know what was really happening right now. First of all, remember that the work of God has somehow gotten sidetracked. How does it get sidetracked? A lot of times we'll, we can say the devil did it. But sometimes it's just because of us. Sometimes it's because of us. Sometimes God's work gets sidetracked. Sometimes we get away from it and not doing what we should do. Why? Because we've got different things we want to do. We've got stuff that's more important to us, which leads to this thing here. Sometimes God's work, instead of it being primary, it becomes secondary become secondary. So it gets sidetracked. And the reason is because it becomes a secondary thing in our lives. And we have to stop and ask ourselves, have we allowed God's business to become secondary in our lives? And remember, we're working on us. Remember that we're trying to be holy because he's holy. We're building a temple because we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We have a place for God to dwell, for God to live, for God to work out of. And God is saying, I need you to get busy making sure that that temple is what it's supposed to be. So we have to ask ourselves, this question. Have we gotten sidetracked? Have we allowed God's work to become secondary? And then here's what the big problem was. Not only was it sidetracked and secondary, but it just stopped. God's work wasn't going forward anymore. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Again, they were more concerned about them or they were more afraid of the enemy. Remember we told you a few weeks ago that they were afraid and that they, of course, were apathetic and they were affluent. In other words, they were afraid of the enemy. They were apathetic to the fact that God wanted them to do a work and they had everything they want affluent. They didn't need anything from God. And so God's work, again, sidetracked, secondary, and stopped. And then what God does, if you go back to Ezra chapter number 5, real quick, like, look at chapter number 5, verse 1. Bible says, then the prophets, who? Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido, uh, uh, Ido prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. So what happened? And you got it on your outline, so we just kind of hit it. What happened was is that men of God came, started talking to them, started sharing what thus says the Lord. Start trying to get them to understand that what they were doing, which is what they, not, they were not doing what they should be doing. It was, a, it was not o, a commission. It was omission at this time. You know, you can commit things against God, but you can omit things that God wants you to do. And so what they were doing, they had stopped doing what God had told them to do. So the prophets came and started preaching. Remember I told you last week, and you see it on your outline, that the preaching was direct. I mean, it was straight to the point. There wasn't any beating around the bush. It wasn't any of this here. What did you mean by that? <laughs> they said, this is what we mean. And this is what we're trying to get a point across. God's work has stopped. God's work is secondary. God's work has been sidetracked because we're more concerned about what we want in life instead of what God wants from our lives. Right. And we told you also not only that they were preaching was direct, but the preaching was different. There were different type of preaching going on. And we kind of help you understand that they had Haggai and they had Zach, uh, Zachariah and they had um, Malachi. And we told you some things. I don't know if I gave this to you last week, but get a hold of this here. When it came to the preaching, the first preacher was a confronting preacher. I mean, he just got in your face. He just busted your chops. He just pointed right at you and didn't care what, how you took it. Because the truth of the matter is this. He was saying, I'm talking on behalf of God. Now, a lot of people don't like that kind of a preaching. Matter of fact, I've been around churches where they say, you know what, again, uh, what you said is not a problem. It's the way you said it. 
It's the way you said it. And you know what? We ought to, again, we ought to be, be, be kind and we ought to be uh, ready to, you know, be compassionate in our preaching and stuff like that. But you understand something here. A lot of times people don't hear you anyway. I just be honest with you. And God wants his message to go forth. A lot of times people will cut you off. So the preacher, I think, hey, yeah, I said this. I'm going to get it in before you close your ears. So he was a confronting preacher. Zechariah was a compassionate preacher. So what does that mean? He was basically saying God's got some great things in store for you. But he also said you need to get right with God. Yeah. See, a lot of times, again, we like that part. God has great things in store for you. But you need to get right with God. God says, draw nigh unto me, but you, you, you know, and he'll draw nigh to you. But you need to cleanse your hearts, your sinners, and purify your. Right. Yeah. Come on. God, here's, what, here's, what we, here's what we want. We, we just, we, people say, this, that was just not enough love over there. Love is when we tell you what's supposed to be said from the word of God. Yeah. And again, I'm not trying to make any excuses for my preaching. I'm just trying to say, sometimes we confront, sometimes there's compassion. But then we had that last preacher, and he was challenging. He was challenging. What do you mean by that? He was challenging. He was basically saying here, you know what? Here's, the, here's what the Bible says. And I ask the question, are you going to do it? Here's what you need to realize. Remember Malachi, he was the one, will a man rob God? And then he said, but you robbed me and tithes and offerings. So he kind of got there to the point. Then he says, so bring ye all the tithes. In other words, he was challenging. You know what's wrong. You know what you should be thinking about. Now let's get it right with God. Amen. So they had different type of preaching going on. But here's what I wanted you to get from that point when it came to last week. You and I need to learn how to listen to preaching. We need to listen for the standard from the word of God in preaching. In other words, if it's not lining up with the Bible, then we need to basically say here, I need a standard, a, a, a Bible, a scriptural preacher. Amen. I need somebody who's going to take the word of God and say, here's what the Bible says. And we also told you that if they're going to be scriptural, then that means whatever they're saying, they're going to get the substance of it and the support from the word of God. Uh, I know a lot of times we preachers will give stories and we'll share this and we'll share that and stuff. But God is saying, make sure they get to the Bible. And make sure they get back to the Bible, even if we go off on one of those side roads. Amen. And because if you don't do that, then guess what? God says he's not helping. God saves souls by the foolishness of preaching. God gets lives right by the foolishness of preaching. We need preaching. Amen. Amen. And so we want to get, get to the word of God. And so make sure that no matter how different they are, that somehow they, of course, you can see the scripture and you can see the substance and the support is coming from the Bible. And then we wanted to let you know, point number one, about the project was divine. The project was divine. In other words, they were building a house of God in Jerusalem. So you and I need to stop and say to ourselves this, ask ourselves this question. Are we building something for God, something that God can use, a place where God can dwell? A lot of times, again, we get, we get so busy building up, let's say, a building or trying to have some numbers. And here's what God is saying. But I need some people whose heart is perfect toward me. Mm -hmm. Amen. And a lot of times we'll say, okay, I got that going on, God. Here's something. I don't know if I gave it to you last week. I think I did. Remember Colossians chapter 3, verse 23? Colossians 3, 23. And it says, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So however we live in our lives, God is saying, make sure that you line it up for the Lord and not for man, not even for yourself. Amen. Then watch this. First Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So whatever I'm doing in life, I want to make sure God gets the glory. It's not about me getting the gift or whatever it is, but I want to make sure God gets the glory. Amen. And so if God's going to get the glory when it comes to preaching, here's some things I want you to get. Because all this time, here's what we want to do. We want to receive. We want to receive. We want to receive. We want to get this blessing. We want to get this gift. We want to get this opportunity. And God says, how about you doing this? How about looking for the areas that you need to repent in? Let's have a change of your mind, which brings something into your heart, which comes out in your life. Amen. When was the last time we really came to an old-fashioned altar or even in our home, in our quiet place, and said, dear God, this is my area of my life needs to be dealt with. I know it. You're showing it to me. I'm going to get it right. Now, a lot of times, here's what we say. I, I don't drink. I don't chew. And I don't run with those that do. And God says, but yeah, but you got a rotten attitude. Yeah, but I, I, see, I see how that tongue lashes out. Amen. 
Yeah, but yeah, and I, I even see I even see how you respond to the preaching. It, 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 I, I just don't agree with that. I don't understand something here. I'm not saying you agree with everything that I say, but we should all say I will agree with whatever the Bible says. Amen. Amen. And so God said there ought to be some repentance. There ought to be getting this a new life in the church, a revival. Amen. Amen. Then God is saying if that's not happening, something is wrong. Remember, we're going to submit to God's word, and God said there should be some repentance and there should be some revival. And get this here, there ought to be a return back to the Lord. Amen. A lot of times people are hearing the word of God, and there's no getting back to God. Matter of fact, there's no getting to God and even in the first place. There's no vows. There's no, there's no living up to what God will have for us in our lives. And God is saying, but preaching ought to change you. So first of all, we told you there was submission to God's word. And I know it's taking a little while, but we'll get to point number three. And then the next thing we told you about was the scheme against God's work. The scheme against God's work. Remember in verse number three, the Bible said at the same time. At the same time. What does that mean? At the same time. This is Ezra 5. We're getting over there into the rest in a minute. Ezra 5, verse number three, the Bible says whenever you and I do something for God, at the same time the devil starts doing something to stop God's work. So you say, well, the devil's not messing with me. Well, ask yourself this question. What am I doing for the cause of Christ? Amen. If I'm doing nothing, the devil said, I got some more people I need to bother. Right. I need some more folks' nerves I need to get on. Right. I, got, I got some more people who, who, who I need to take an attack and who I need to mess with. Now, understand something. Now, here's what somebody's going to say. I knew the devil was on me because I'm serving God. God says, no, no, don't, 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 don't try to be the one who's always saying I'm serving God. Now I'm being attacked. God said, how about this? How about saying I'm being attacked because the fact is maybe God's getting on me. Hey, man. A lot of times, we, again, we like, I, I, I like this. I'm just going through like Job. Well, remember, Job was one who feared God. Job was one who, shoot, stayed away from evil. Amen. Job was one who, when things were going wrong in his life, by the way of the attacks of the devil, he still worshiped God. Amen. So when we start talking about, I'm going through like Job, God says, wait, 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 before you compare yourself to Job, remember, I said there was none like him. Now, understand something here. You and I can become like a Job when our trials come, when our heartaches are hit us. We can be saying, you know what, God? I know my Redeemer living. Amen. Amen. I know everything going to be all right. Amen. Amen. God is saying, but our problem today is this. A lot of times we want to say it's the devil. And God says, no, it's maybe you. But we're not looking at that right now. That was a side road. Is it Okay. That was the side road. So here's the thing I want you to write down or remember underneath the scheme against God's work. First of all, the predictable. It's, it's, a, it's predictable. God says you need to realize something here. We gave you 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened happen unto you. God said it's predictable. And here's the thing about it. You and I need to take and be practice this thing what the Bible says and look at it if you would be verse number five Ezra five verse five but the eye of, the, of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease it's predictable but here's what God is asking what's going to be your practice what's going to be your action what's going to be your habit when your attacks come the question always is what is going to take to make you quit what is, what is it going to take to get you and I to say, you know what, God, I'm not taking this anymore. What, 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 uh, God tells us don't be weary and well doing for in due season we should reap if we faint not, Galatians 6, 9. But guess what? So many people fall out and they never see what God can do. So God is asking you and I a question here. Uh, even though we know this is predictable, what's going to be our normal practice or our normal habit or our normal action? And then we told you something here. You and I aren't in this alone. So we got predictable, we got a practice, and then we got a powerful ally. Hey, man. You know, that's what they talk about around the world. This is our ally, and that's our ally. Here's our ally. In other words, they say, who, who's on our sides when we go to war? I tell you what, I don't know if any nation's on my side, but I know God's on my side. Hey, man. And we just tried to help you a little bit all throughout that chapter about where it talks about God. Now, do this for me. I don't know if I gave this to you before we get to point number three. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 16. 2 Chronicles chapter number 16. 2 Chronicles chapter number 16. And I want you to read, I'm going to read verse number five, the first part of it again in Ezra 5. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews. Did you get that? 
God's eye was upon them. And the Bible said that they, 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 they caused them not to cease. God's eye is upon them. But here's the thing I want you to get, again, because we got a powerful ally. Second Chronicles 16, verse number 9. Notice what it says here. But the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, get this now, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Amen. You know what the Bible says? God says, I'm looking for somebody I can work with. Somebody I can work through. Somebody I can get something done with. But I need them to have a heart that's perfect toward me. I need them to take and believe again that I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. I need them to realize I'm their shepherd and they shall not want. Amen. Amen. God is saying our problem today is this, is that we really don't know or we don't believe maybe that God can see us through. And God said, I'm just looking for somebody who can say I can. Hey, he told him over there in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse number 30. What are you doing? He said, I'm looking for a man. I want a man who can do what? Who can take and make up the hedge and stand in the gap for the land that I won't destroy it. And he said these sad words, but I found none. I just couldn't find somebody. You and I ought to say, you know what, God? Like, like, like I said, here am I. Send me. Amen. Amen. But God is saying, I'm just looking for somebody. Yeah. I got my eyes going to and fro, and I just want somebody who I can use. Now, wait a minute. That verse didn't end, though. He said this in that verse, herein, thou hast done foolishly. God's talking again to another group at another time, but he says this. Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. Now, we're going to always have wars, but isn't it nice to have a war and know that God's on your side? Amen. When you get to the book of Joshua, chapter number five, Joshua sees the captain of the host of the Lord's army. And he said, whose side are you on? And basically, God didn't even answer that question. Because you know what the real question is this it, to Joshua, whose side you on? Right. Yeah. I'm the captain of the host of the Lord's army. Guess what? So this is the side you need to be on. Amen. Yeah. So God is trying to teach us something here today. That we're going to have the devil on us, but we got God for us. Amen. Amen. Always. Which leads to point number three now. You say, preacher, by the time you got there, well, we'll be here for a minute. Really, we won't. I just want to help us understand. Remember this here. In, verse number, in, in the first part of this message, remember we told you, if you want to write something next to those outlines again, here's what we must do. Let's submit to the word of God. Here's what the devil will do. Attack us. The third part, here's what God will do. What's that? Support us. When we decide to do what God wants us to do, I'm going to submit to the word of God. Joshua said in Joshua 1, number 8, that I need to take and meditate and do according to all that is written there. That's my job. Then I'll make my way prosperous and I'll have good success. That's my job. But guess what? I, I, listen, the devil's going to always attack me. Anybody decide to live godly to suffer persecution. But guess what? Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we get to this point in the message now. God is asking you and I, what are we going to do? Right. Now we got God on our side. What are we going to do? I hope we'll say, you know what? I'm going to do the will of God. I'm going to find the will of God. I want the will of God for my life. Amen. Amen. Now do this for me. Go, if you would, please, to Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. We skipped over a lot of stuff there. I know in chapter 5. You read it, and I hope you got a hold of it. But in Ezra chapter number 6, listen to this, if you would, please. Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rose, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. Verse 2. And there was found at Arkmita, at that place right there, in the palace that is in the providence of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. So here's what has happened. Over in chapter number five, uh, uh, Tatnai, he goes and says, you know what? Remember the questions? Uh, 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 who told you to do this? Who's been doing it? And are, are you sure you're supposed to be doing this? Listen, this, I, I love this. When anybody asks you a question and you're trying to serve God, who told you to do that? Well, the same God told you to do. Live a holy, come on now. You know, because you got a world out there saying, is that, matter of fact, here's what they used to say to me, Miss Valerie, is all that necessary? When I was in the military, that's what they say, is all that necessary? Is all that separation, all that sanctification, all of that, is all that necessary? Do you have to live that way? 
Hey, by the way, and I know I'm online right now here. Today I had something done, and I had an individual that was doing this work for me, and I, and I was talking to him about Jesus Christ, and that is, he had a need for Christ. He basically told me this here, Miss Jamie, that he didn't have a need right now. I said, what do you mean you don't have a need right now? Well, I'm not sick, and I don't need any money. And I, don't, and I said, you need the Lord now because you're a sinner. And they started talking to me about, you know, these different religions. And I said, wait a minute. Let me just share with you where, where, where I'm going to give you some facts from the Bible. Well, the Bi- I said, I know what you're going to say. Man wrote the Bible. Right. I said, but, but let me ask you a question. When, when did this nation get started? He said, he gave me 1776. And I said, good. I said, where'd you get that from? Huh. He said, from the books they taught me in. I said, oh, so you believe the books they taught you. You were never there. You don't have any real proof. Come on now. Well, we got a constitution. Man wrote that. So I started talking to him about some stuff. And I started talking about, we don't have just the history. We got the prophecy. And I told him all about the prophecy. And then I told him a little bit about how the Bible, it's not, it's, listen me, it's not a scientific book, but it sure enough have enough science in it. It's not a medical book, but it sure got a lot of medicine in it. It's not an archaeological book, but it sure got some archaeological finds in it. Amen. And he started saying, wow, nobody ever told me that stuff. And I just started sharing with him and stuff. And he said, here's what he said. I'm, trying, I'm getting to the point. Here's what he said. Man, you sound like my mother. I said, what do you mean? He said, she religious. I said, I'm not religious. I'm not trying to be religious. I said, I got a relationship. And I told him about when it started and stuff. And then he started telling me about his mom being religious and stuff like that. And I started saying, wow. Wow, she's religious. Matter of fact, she named him. His name is Jacob Daniel. And I won't give you the last name. I said, wow. I said, maybe one day your name will be changed from Jacob to Israel. Oh, I was working them over. Amen. And then all of a sudden I said, well, somebody dropped you off. Who dropped you off? And he told me, his mother. I was like, man, I can't wait to meet her. And this is what he told me. He's from another city. She drove him into town. The, relig- the, the religious one. Uh-huh. Amen. She didn't want him to come to town by himself. Because she said, if I drive you, it'll give me enough time to go to the casino and gamble. That's, that's the kind of religion we it's the kind of religion we have today. You and I need to understand something. That's not a religion that's pleasing God right now. As a matter of fact, a real relationship with God in our hearts will say, that's, I don't care who's listening to me right now. I'm just telling you something. God's not for us giving our money to people that are going to take it. And by the way, they're not making you rich. They're getting rich. And God talks about that trying to hustle real quick. A hasty and get gain. Amen. Amen. So please don't go get those lottery tickets. Amen. Say, preacher, what's that all about? I'll preach on that one sometime too. Amen. Hey, man. You don't need to go to that casino and get that alcohol, even though it's free. Amen. Remember, I told you it's not a casino, it's a casino. Yeah. In the middle of sin. Yeah. It got sin. Come on now, help me, somebody. You and I need to say, you know what, God? I'm going to take and do your thing your way. I want your will for my life. Amen. Here's our problem today. Many of us will say, well, I can't find God's will. God says, that is the same lie that you get from the devil. Amen. Amen. The devil is telling that lie. God is saying, no, you can find, my will is not elusive and my will is not a mystery. Come on, help me now. Amen. You say, why? How how do you know that? Because God's will is right here. And all you and I have got to do is read it. Now, here's what what happened. Are you with me right now? I want you to really get a hold of this here. So we got success in God's will. God had told, if you go back to chapter number one, he's told the king to go and get him, build a house for him over there in Jerusalem in Judah. He told him that. And he told the people, you go back and you take and do that. So Tet and I, here's what he said there, Brother Miguel. He said, would you please search the road and see? Big mistake. Well, if you're going to search the road with God's word, you're going to always find out what God wants. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly what they did. They thought, so here's the thing I want you to write real quickly. Here, please get a hold of this. First of all, when it comes to God's word, it is discernible. All you got to do is look for it. 
His will. It is discernible. God said, he said in verse number one, search was made in the house of the rose. You and I need to make a search in the word of God. You want to know what thus says the Lord? You want to know if the stuff I'm telling you right now is true? You look in the Word. Don't go by, here's what I think, here's what I believe. No, you go by what thus says the Lord. Amen. And God has a lot of wisdom when it comes to Proverbs about different things like that, about rich to get gained, about being co-signers. And I better leave that part alone too. God didn't get no amen on that, but that's okay. God is saying, my word is discernible. All you got to do is look for it. It's not elusive. It's not a mystery. It is written down. They found God's word. They found what was said about building this temple in the row. So let me give you some things real quickly. First of all, it's discernible. And then number two, write this, and then I'll give you these things. It's also doable. God's word is discernible, and it's also doable. What do you mean by that? Do you understand that they went back, start building the house of God? Why? Because it was something that could be done. Good. Your life and my life can be a better dwelling place for God. It's something that can be done. Amen. Oh, it's so hard. No, it's not. Amen. And his word's not grievous. In other words, God is saying, you take my yoke upon you, learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come on, somebody. Amen. Our problem today is this, is that when it comes to the will of God, we don't understand. Write this down here. First of all, that you can come to God's will, there's the preservation of God's will. It's in the book. Amen. Amen. The preservation, I may have left that out for you. Hey, if God says it's discernible and it is doable, here's the things I want you to get. You got to read it, receive it, and respond to it. Amen. I'll say it again. Read it. Receive it, then respond to it. Amen. What's our biggest problem today? A lot of people aren't doing that. A lot of people aren't receiving it first, of, reading it first of all. Yeah. And then when they do read it, they don't receive it. And of course, if you don't receive it, you're not going to respond to it. Amen. So God is saying, I want you to understand, I preserve my word from generation to generation. Amen. You're not going to say that we've been left without a copy of God's book. Amen. Amen. God is always, when he gave this book to his children, and of course Moses was the, was, was, was the one writing those first five ones and stuff, and he made sure there's copies of it that was passed down. So here's our biggest problem today. We don't read God's word. You want success? Read the word of God. You want to take and be everything God would have you to be? Read the word of God. You want to keep from defiling your life and destroying it? Read the word of God. Amen. You ought to pray like this. Psalm 119 verse 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Amen. Read the word of God. Now remember I said you read it, you receive it, and then you respond to it. Preacher, I'm doing that. Okay, if we're doing it. Can I ask you a question? When God says, forgive, why don't we? Mmm, because I don't like that part. Too many, come on now, too many people are holding grudges today. And God says, I need you to learn to forgive. Now, if you don't forgive, why do you expect your, heavenly father, your father in heaven to forgive you? He's just showing us here, you want it, I think it's time for you to give it. Amen. Wow. Yeah, uh, I told you, don't put shoes on, we're not done yet. I didn't say we're getting ready to pray. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get some stuff built. We need to build a temple for God that he can dwell in and get, listen, if you save, he's in there. But he's almost like he's got to run to a corner to find a quiet spot. How about this here? Are you still with me? Uh, no, no. How about not just forget? How about, how about, okay, oh, God, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. How, how about this here? How about marriage? You say, preach, first of all, let's make sure we get into marriage God's way. I hope you young people hear me. Read it, receive it, then respond to it. Let's get into marriage God's way. Let's do it the way God said to do it. 
What, what, you don't have no business with this one, and no business with that one, and no business with that one. All that through first, Second Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse number 14. You got no business with that. And then he said in verse 70, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, said the Lord. Amen. You got no business being involved in that type of relationship. Now, I know there's been a lot of mistakes that have been made, so you say, Preacher, but I didn't do it that way. Didn't ask God forgiveness, so let's move on. Yeah, Why? Because God said once you're in that relationship, it's time to stay. Yeah. Well, preacher, God gave us an out. I know we're always looking for one. God said, because of the hardness of your heart, I let you, I let you, I let you out of that thing because of adultery. But from the beginning, it was not to be so. I, you say preacher. Now you don't know. You don't know what I've been through. No, I don't know what you've been through. But I know God knows something about marriage, and marriage is a foundation that this nation needs. Amen. 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 Our kids need it. As a matter of fact, did you know what they said, brother, brother Larry? They say the baby boomers now are divorcing more than any other group. You know the reason why? Because they they had a belief had a belief that you stay together for the kids. Now that all the kids are gone, it's time for us to. That's why you get married for the right reasons. Amen. And that's the reason why you don't invest in the kids, you invest in the spouse. Amen. Say why? Because at 18, they don't want to be around you no way. Amen. I need some friends. I want to go out and see the world, and I, except for a couple. They don't want to go anywhere without mom and dad. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but that's good. I'm not doing anything until God tells me to and I get some approval from the home. Yeah. Okay, I, I better get off of this point. You say, preacher, what else you got? Hey, I got marriage, I got money, I got our morals, I got our ministries. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of stuff. We don't do it the way God said. See, here's the thing about it. God said, bring the first fruits. Some of us don't tithe like we should. I'm supposed to get the first, but no, okay, I'm not, I'm not mad. I'm just preaching the word of God. See, we don't want to search the role. We don't want to know what thus says the Lord, because I don't want to do it that way. Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me move on here. How about this here? Not only do we see the preservation of God's word, how about the purpose of God's will? Sorry about that, the preservation of God's will, but we see the purpose of God's will. God kept his will in a book, even though the, the heathens had it. They found what was thus said, what God wanted, what Cyrus had said. Now, the next thing we get is the purpose of God's will. Now, first of all, I want you to know this here. Everything that's in God's will is good for the saints. Amen. Amen. Everything in the will of God is good for the saints. Amen. Amen. But listen to this now. Everything that's in the will of God is, is for God's glory. If it, if it's, listen to me. Here was somebody said, that's good for me. If God not getting the glory from it, then it's not God's will. God never, are you still with me now? God's not saying, I want you to experience good and it don't bring me glory. That's why people always say, I know God want me happy. How about this? You've heard it. God want us holy. And when I'm holy, I'll be happy. Because I've delighted myself in the Lord. And he gives me, I talked about it Sunday evening. He gives me the desires of my heart. Amen. So God is saying, that this whole thing is a purpose. Why are you guys doing all that? That was the question that was asked. Because the fact is that God had told them that we're going to build a house for God. Now listen to this here. Look at verse number 7. Ezra 6. I wish I had time to preach every little verse. But listen, let the work of this house of God alone. Now, hear what God is saying. That house that's being built, that's for me. And Mr. Smutty Face, you leave it alone. Now, we're going to find out. It's always going to be another attack. But aren't you glad you and I got the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God on our side? Amen. See, God says, leave it alone. Why? Because they're building a house for me. This ain't just any old house. This is, this is the house for me. Notice what he says. Are you still with me? He said, let alone, let the, let, the, let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build his house of God in his place. 
Verse 8, moreover, I make a decree what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, wherefore if expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. Leave it alone. Amen. God said, my will will be done. And I can step in anytime I get ready. Somebody say amen. amen. But you and I need to recognize what the purpose is. Right. Not just for our good. But everything that is good for us must line up with the glory of God. So can I ask you the decisions that we're making? Oh, that's good for me. But is God getting glorified? The direction we're going. Well, that's good for me. But is God getting glorified? Remember, the destination I'm going to end up at. That's good for me. But is God going to be glorified? A lot of times what we do is we do what we want to do. And God does not get the glory. Yeah. Or preacher, I've been doing what God told me. And it just doesn't seem like it's working out. Let me say this and then I'm, I'll give you an illustration here. I, the will of God is the safest place, the successful place, and the sure place where God's hand is going to be. The sure, the safest, and it's going to be the, uh, the uh, successful place when it comes to God's will. You and I need to say, I'm going to find God's will no matter what. No matter what, I want to be in God's will. And when you bring glory to God, look at verse number 10. Glory, are you still with me? God said, let that house alone. Why? That they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his son. You know what they just said right there, Luke? You, 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 do you know what they just said? They just said, you, you better leave God's people alone. They praying for you. You know, right now they, they say that, that they're trying to hunt us Christians down. Yeah. Yeah, they're trying to hunt the Christians down. They want to know who the Christians are. Who's the one believe in this book? I thought most of them that's up there in Congress said they believed in it. Come on now. <laughs> I know we don't like this guy, but God is saying, guess what here? You and I need to understand that the sacrifices that have been made there to me, the supplication that's been made is good for you, so you better leave them alone. Amen. There's purpose in us becoming the children of God. Then write this down. So, so you say, preacher, we're done. I know I forgot to put one down. I looked at it when I got in here. <laughs> so we see the preservation. We see the purpose. But write this down, the protection. The protection of God's will. Look at verse number 11 and 12. Also, I have made a decree. Who's that? Sir? Uh, there is what you say. And whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house and being set up, let him be hanged thereon and let his house be made a dunghill for this. Wow. And the God that have caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. You say, preacher, what is all of that? God's protection. Say, well, preacher, later on, you gave it to us over there in chapter 4. Remember, you started talking about how they said this and how they said stop. Hey, guess what? Sometimes God let us, let us hit that wall to see what we're going to do. So if you hit a wall, say, you know what? I'm still going on for Jesus. Amen. Write this verse down and I'm done. Zechariah 1, verse 16. Therefore, thus said the Lord. Remember, Zechariah was one of the preachers. I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, said the Lord of hosts, and a line shall stretch forth unto Jerusalem. Oh, it's going to get done. If you and I are willing to allow God to use us, God said, I can build a place in your life. Hey, man. As a matter of fact, when I got done talking to that individual today, you know what he said to me? He said, you really believe that stuff, don't you? I said, yes, I do. He said, it's obvious. I said, what makes it so obvious to you? He said, not just with the authority that you speak about it, but with the joy that's on your face. Amen. He said, you ain't stopped smiling since you've been talking. Because you know what? I know he need what I've got. Amen. 
So this is one of the reasons why you and I need to say, I'm getting busy. In fact, I'm getting ready to preach a message. I don't know if I'm going to do it this Sunday or next Sunday, but God's laid it on my heart. We got to make the main thing the main thing. Amen. Now, we're building our lives. But you know what God says? Well, how can they call upon whom they not believed? And how they, can they believe in whom they not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? There's lives today. Not everybody is rejecting the things of God. Some just don't get to hear it. Will you and I be ones that will take the word out? And I'm going to show you why we got to do what God's called us to do. So guess what? I may hit a roadblock here and there. I may have to have a detour. I may sometimes, it may look like I'm just totally stopped. But I've read the book enough. Even Stephen being stoned to death for me to live as Christ but to die as gain. Paul's the grace is sufficient. It'll get you through it. Oh yeah. Amen. Now, listen, and God is saying the same thing for you and I. We'll come out on the winning side. Amen? Amen. But we got to let God's work begin again in our lives. If we don't, it's gonna hurt us. There's a whole world of people we say we care about Amen. that'll never know what we're talking about. Father, bless now, I pray. Help us now as we prepare for offering.